yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rappers fed. All right, so last class we were talking about uh, uh, how to take a query plan, divide it up into its pipelines, uh, and into separate tasks or it within a task set, and then be able to execute them. And then we spent a bit of time focusing on uh, the, the idea of like NUMA awareness in our algorithms so that we try to minimize the amount of non-local memory access. So that won't be so much an issue today when we talk about vectors execution, less also of an issue for when we talk about uh, compilation next week, query compilation next week. But that, that'll come up again when we talked about, um, when we talk about uh, the parallel join algorithms, because that's we spend a lot of time in those, and we make sure that we try to maximize the again local local memory access. All right. So today's class, we're going to um, focus on query, uh, vectorized queries execution. And the, the paper I had you guys read was um, it was sort of a high level introduction to the things that matter in uh, a vectorized execution engine. And the, what AVX 512 allows you to do that, that you couldn't, couldn't previously do um, before then. So we'll talk about some quick background of what vectorization means to the concept of databases. Then we'll talk about, about different ways to actually implement it in, in your database system. Then we'll talk about the fundamental building blocks for, for using SIMD that allows to then do the vectorized uh, database algorithms. So the paper you guys read, they, they talked about doing scans, uh, I think hash, hash table lookups, and I think that the geospatial thing, like I said, we'll ignore geospatial one. We'll go beyond. So we'll do the scans, do the hash tables, and we'll also do look at um, uh, histograms as well, because it's another, that comes from another paper. So, all right, so let's get started. So it sort of goes without saying, I think everyone here has taken 418, 618, right? Or no? Everyone's mostly aware what vectorization or SIMD is. Um, but the basic idea is here is that we want to. Uh, convert an algorithm that we would normally have in our database system that would operate on a maybe single tuple at a time or a single piece of data at a time. And we want to convert it into a vectorized form that is going to allow us to process multiple pieces of data at the same time. And this is something that we can rely on the hardware provide for us because it's going to have these SIMD instructions that uh, allow us again to, to, within a single instruction call, operate on multiple things at the same time. And that's the fundamental building block of what we can rely on to then build these more complex things that we need in our database system. Right? It's not enough just to add two numbers together. We want to actually do scans and other things. So we can use those, those, those low-level SIMD primitives to allow us to again, build a vectorized execution engine. And so obviously, it's, it goes without saying why this actually matters, because uh, it's additional parallelism that we can exploit in our hardware. So th think of a really simple thought experiment like this. We have a some algorithm in our database system, I'm not saying what it is, it doesn't matter at this point, but it's some algorithm that we can parallelize uh, the execution of, of, the, of the task across 32 cores. But now I'll assume that also each core is gonna have a four, four wide or four lane SIMD register. That means within each core, they can run uh, our algorithm in parallel four times. So we take our single al algorithm, we can be parallelized by 32 times, then each core now is also getting a four X parallelism. So it's multiplicative. So in total, we're going to get 128x speed up over the single-threaded SISTI version or the scalar version of that algorithm, right? So that's massive. That's a huge win. That's what we want. To, that's, what, that's why we're spending all this time trying to do this. Of course, the spoiler is going to be we're never actually going to achieve that because that's like the theoretical upper bound. Um, and in the case of, of you know, in a database system, there's a bunch of stuff we need to do. Uh, that we can't, we're not going to be able to vectorize. Um, and so we'll never actually achieve this, but for the parts that are like in the kernel, like the for loops we're spinning through processing tuples, for the things that are very repetitive, uh, you know, and, and that we can vectorize, you know, it will be a big win for us. It's just we're never going to get that total mass of 120x speed up. We'll get like two, maybe four x speed up in practice. All right? So, Right, so SIMD, again, it stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data. Uh, so this is an old concept that goes back to, I think, the 1960s. There was this Flynn's taxonomy that talks about SISD versus SIMD, like the different types of CPU instructions you can have. Um, but now it's, it's in, the, in, in the modern era, at least in this century, uh, in the last 20-something 20, 20 years, uh, pretty much these are you know, 
these are within all modern CPUs have, have these uh, architecture support for, for SIMDs. So x86 has a bunch of different variants. Uh, so the original one was back in the 1990s, this thing called MMX. They like, this is like Pentium stuff, like 95, 96, 97. Um, and it was really simplistic back then. It was like, I think, 128-bit registers. And the problem with the old version was like when you ever switch into SIMD mode, it shut down the, the, the rest of the CPU. So you could only do SIMD and then SISD, right? You couldn't, you couldn't multiplex them. When the SSE stuff, uh, when these things came out, then you could do things in parallel, right? Power has their own thing. ARM has their own thing. And RISC-V, I don't, I mean, RISC-V is an open source uh, ISA, but they had a proposal for how, how they're going to do it, right? So what's different about the RISC-V ones, like, they don't, where all of these are going to have, like, specific instructions that depend on, like, what the data type is and what the register size is. The RISC-V one is, like, it's, it's like the instruction, this is what I want to do, and I don't really, don't really necessarily care what the, the, the data type size is. The hardware figures it out for me. Because it's just a proposal at this point. All right, so really simple example of what SIMD does. So you want to add two vectors together and produce an output vector z. Right? So if you want to implement this in, in a procedural language like, like in C, we would, you know, it, it would look sort of something like this. So with the SISD instructions, it's just looping through this for loop and going one at a time at every single uh, offset in our two vectors, adding them together as a single instruction, and then populating our output vector z. Right? And then the you know, compiler can try to unroll this, do other, other optimizations you want to do. But at the end of the day, it's like going to be you know, one, you know, one input, or one, one piece of data, adding two numbers, and produce one output. With SIMD now, what we're going to do is be able to batch these uh, batch together the, the, the you know, entries of the vector and say we're doing 120-bit registers because these, these are 32-bit integers, so we can store four elements, or there's a four-wide or four-lane SIMD register. So now it's one instruction to take this vector out of this vector and produce another output vector. And then we just go along to the next one and, and do the same thing. All right? So previously before, I had what? There's eight entries. I did eight instructions to add together uh, you know, the, the two vectors together to add these two numbers up to, to list the number, but if, with SIMD, I can do it in two instructions. I'm ignoring, like, how do you get, you know, this, this location in memory in, into the register and then add it together and get it back out, right? That's the overhead that we have to deal with and take advantage of it. And that's why we're never going to achieve that maximum, uh, that upper bound for us, right? So there's two types of vectorization we're going to want to do. So the first one is horizontal vectorization. And the idea here is that we're going to take some input uh, and we're going to do the same operation on all the elements uh, within that input register and it produces a scalar output. Right, so say I have a SIMD add instruction that takes an input vector of four elements. I'm just going to add them together and then produce a single output somewhere. Right? But in a database system, what we're going to want to do, is, uh, which is more common, is vertical uh, vectorization where the idea is that we're going to perform a sort of element-wise operation in parallel across values in different vectors that are in the same lane. Right? So think of these as just offsets, 0, 1, 2, 3. So in the first, first offset here, I'll do addition for the, for the first element and this one, and then produce an output and do the same thing going down. So we'll see this in our algorithms. This is, this is what we're going to try to do. And the game we're going to want to play is we want to ride along or the, the, whatever the operations we want to do keep everything in the SIMD registers as far as long as possible without having to go back to memory. Because transferring data from register to register is really fast. Having to go back to, back to memory, which is going to be L1 cache, then back to the, uh, then back to the register is, is going to be expensive. So we'll have to design some of their algorithms in such a way that uh, for the things that SIMD can't do, like if branches, if clauses, we can play tricks like we saw before to have like branchless scans or predicate evaluation, do the same thing, but now we can do it in SIMD. Right. Okay. So uh, the type of instructions that are available to us, again, I, th I think I've covered a lot of these already. Uh, you can move data in and out of the registers and, and, and then between registers. You can do all the arithmetic you want to do to, normally in SISD. You can do in SIMD. Do all the bitwise comparison operators um, for you know, ands and ors and xors and so forth. Uh, then you can do all our predicate evaluations we want to do, less than, greater than, uh, not equals to, and so forth. There'll be shuffle instructions that move data between SIMD registers in, uh, based on certain patterns. 
So I can say, like, I want the first element, the third element from this register to go in this other register. And then there'll be methods to transform data that's in the sort of x86 native format into what the Symbi expects. Um, and then as well as moving data maybe from out of the Symbi register directly to memory and bypassing the CPU cache. These are sometimes called streaming instructions. And you do this because you like, say, I, I know that I'm not going to look at some piece of data I just computed. I'll put it out into memory using a streaming instruction so I, and then don't pollute my CPU cache because I know I'm not going to read it uh, in the near future, right? So avoiding CPU caches is going to be useful for joins uh, because you don't need, you know after I you know, do a join, I'm not going to immediately use that tuple. I'm going to go back and get more tuples and compute the rest of the join. So the, the streaming stuff helps with that, right? And we'll see this next week when we talk about uh, some stuff with Hyper. The question is, what happens if you divide by zero? How does Symbi handle divide by zero? Yeah, I actually don't know. Yeah. Let me Google that for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I just. Yeah, the, yeah. The same as I, I, I think you, get, you would get the same error as you normally would in, in Sysd. You get an interrupt, yeah. Yeah. Because right, you can't have, like, uh, how does this? Like, you can't. You can't have conditionals, and you can't do jumps, right? It's, 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 pretty, it's pretty limited what you can do. I say that limited. It's very powerful constructs, but it's not like a general purpose CPU, right? Yeah, but you can trap in, in integer divided by zero arrow errors by, um, like, there's a handler for it. And then but the handler's, the handler's out in, in, in the CPU. It's not, like, it's not something in the registers. Uh, what is it? Okay, we'll take this offline. <laughs> but again, think, like, the SIMD, so the SIMD is, it's, it's going to be the registers and then there's the instructions, mm -hmm. right? And so it's not a, don't think a SIMD is like a device, like a GPU, where this GPU can have sort of trap stuff, right? Yeah. It's, uh, control is always going to have to be back on the, the main processor. And these things are happening in parallel as well. Like, that you could, like, this is what a superscalar out of order execution uh, or CPU can do. Like, the CPU can be processing it's a regular instruction stream while the SIMD stuff is, is happening. And then if there's, if there's a divide by zero, you know, control has to come back to the CPU and then, and then figure out what, what to do next. All right, so here's the sort of a quick summary of what the history of, uh, of uh, you know, SIMD instructions, at least for x86, has looked like. Uh, and I said the first one was, was MMX. It was 64 bits, not 128. And again, I said, this is very, very primitive. MMX doesn't actually mean anything. Uh, I think it's been backported to mean multimedia extension, but Intel is, is paranoid about, about getting sued. So, like, they don't name anything after, like, anything mag magical. Like, all that Sky Lake, uh, Crystal Lake, all those are actually physical lakes, like, on a map. And they, ch they choose those, those things, choose those names, because then they can't get sued and say, hey, you stole my name. It's like, no, no, we, we got it from, you know, the this, this physical lake, right? Same thing with MMX. Like, uh, they, they picked three, three random characters because it sounded cool uh, and put it out there. And then someone did sue them and say, hey, you, know, you stole my idea from MMX. And then they found in the court documents, like, oh, no, it really was three random letters, right? So uh, advanced vector instruction or extensions, I mean, these do mean something. But like, the original stuff didn't mean anything. Um, but this is sort of, what the, the, this is sort of the, the state of the art right now, the AVX 512. And again, in the paper you guys read, this is, they talk about this not just because the, 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 the registers are wider now, 512 bits, but they've added additional things to, uh, to the instruction set that makes it better for doing database operations. Right? This is the permute, the compress and expand stuff. We'll talk about it in a second. Right? And this link here will take you to a great video. It's a few, few years old now from James Rendiers, who was like, uh, he was like a, the, one of the chief architects and evangelists on SIMD uh, instructions at, at Intel. So this gives you like a big history of like of all the cool things you can do with Symbi. I think it's from 2016, 17. So I don't know if it covers uh, AVX 512, but it's it's still it's really interesting to look at. Okay, so uh, what are the trade-offs to using Symbi? So we're gonna get huge performance gains uh, if we can vectorize the, the sort of most expensive the core parts of our uh, of our algorithms inside of our database system. But then the downside is to actually leverage them and use them, 
it's going to be mostly a manual process. It's not something that, uh, in some cases, the compiler is going to easily just figure out for you. Because right? the compiler is not going to know what a hash table is. Right? So we're going to have to write this code ourselves. And well, that's fine, because people pay a lot of money for people to write code like this. So for our purposes, it's fine. But like for, the, for the JavaScript programmer, it's problematic. They're not going to be able to take advantage of this. Right? The SIMD is going to have restrictions on data alignment, so we make sure that, we, that data is in the right form in order to put it in registers, in order to, to actually be able to use them. And we'll see this work from a paper from Columbia. They simplify this, or they make a huge assumption that all your pointers are 32-bit integers and all your keys are 32-bit integers, because then it fits nicely into all these, these registers. But in the real world, we obviously know that's not the case, that, that you, can't, you can't assume that. So it isn't. Accessory like strings, it's, it's always going to be a problem. And then uh, this is less, no longer really an issue anymore, but it used to be a big problem. When I used to give this, uh, give this lecture in the, in the old days, before the pandemic, like getting the data in and out of the registers and moving them between registers was a huge pain in the ass. But now it's actually, because again, ABS 512 and those bit mass things that they talk about, they make this a lot easier. Right, so 512 was is a the 52 bit or one, oh, sorry 512 bit extensions to the AVX2 instructions. I don't know why they called it didn't call it AVX5 because it's all you know it's AVX2 is 256 bit. There, I don't think there is an AVX1, right? So whatever it's called AVX512. And so in addition to having the wider again wider uh, registers, you're going to get the better data conversion, scatter uh, scatter operations, and uh, the permutations. And then with, you know, with this, these bit masks are going to allow us to do things we couldn't do before. But the challenging part about ABX 512, which at least is confusing, is that unlike before, when I showed that, that table, there's like ABX 12, or sorry, ABX 2, and, and SSE SC, you know, 4, and these different versions of, of, their, the, the, of the SIMD extensions, it was, they, were all, all, they were all or nothing. Meaning like if I had a CPU and I said I had ABX 2, I knew I got all the instructions for them. The AVX 512, for whatever reason, Intel has decided to break them up into these different groups. And then some CPUs will have certain instructions, and some CPUs will have, will have other instructions. So if you go to Wikipedia, you'll see this, this, you'll see this table here. And along here, they show you the different versions of, the, of, their, of their ISAs from Intel. And it shows that some of them have uh, some of the features. These are the different uh, groups of AVX 512 instructions. Some of them have some of them. Some of them will have all of them. They always have to have the foundational one. That's the F1. Uh, so if you look on your, uh, unless you're using the, the MacBook, but if you go look in your, you know, your laptop, you'll see AVX 512F. That's the foundation one. But then everything else is sort of random. Um, there's another chart here, again, that shows you what, what some, of, some of them have and don't have. And this only gets up to, to Skylake uh, 2017. All right, so it's, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, there's Linus complaining on, on the, on the um, on the Linux mailing list about how he hopes 512 dies in a fire or whatever. Um, but anyway, but I did check with um, I did check with uh, you know former students and friends at the big database companies like Databricks is using 512, uh, uh, Redshift is using 512, right? So even though I mean they're well they control they control exactly the hardware they're running on, but for like if you're running if you're trying to build a database system that you want to run people run on prem. You know, this could be a problem. So, all right. So, how do we actually implement this in our in our database system? So, there's gonna be basically three approaches. There's the automatic vectorization, compiler hints, and then explicit vectorization. And you can sort of think of this as, as the, the on the scale of what's the easiest thing to use versus what's the hardest to use, but also we have the more fine grained control. And uh, again, I also confirm with our friends in the database world. All the big vendors are using this last one. They're doing explicit vec vectorization with intrinsics. Nobody's going to rely on the compiler uh, for things that they know should be vectorized. They're not going to let the compiler try to figure it out. All right, so automatic vectorization, the idea is that the compiler can hopefully figure out whether the instructions inside of a loop can be, can be vectorized. Um, and it works for really simple things and simple loops, but this is going to be rare in, in database operators. Right, because it's going to have, uh, you know, it's it's not always going to be is something less than something instead of a loop. We'll see how the vectorwise does it and try to try to exploit this. But the to do more complex things, this simply just won't work. 
And of course, you have to have hardware support for it. So basically, if you try to compile this and your hardware doesn't have some instruction that you're relying on, uh, it's either going to throw an error or actually, no, sorry, it wouldn't throw an error because you're not putting explicit SIMD operations in. Just, you wouldn't get it. It would, it would just compile, and you'd get the, the scalar version of it. All right, so here's a function like this. It's, it's what I showed before. We're passing in uh, to this function to add three vectors, uh, pointers to vectors. And we're just going to take the, to, for each, each offset in x and, and y, add them together, and store them into, uh, you know, into z. Can the compiler automatically vectorize this? You're shaking your head no. Why? Yeah, so he says x, y, z can alias each other, right? Meaning the compiler doesn't know at runtime what these things are going to point to, right? So if, uh, if x, or sorry, if z just points to x plus 1, then every time I, uh, I write to x, so I write to z, I'm clobbering something in x, right? And that, that and it would, be, it would be incorrect, right? So the... What the compiler is trying to basically do, if it can vectorize something, it wants to guarantee that the output of the function, or whatever the piece of code you're vectorizing, produces the same result as the non-vectorized or the scalar version. In this case here, because we're dealing with pointers, it can't guarantee that. So another thing you can do is add compiler hints to say, uh, tell it, hey, you should try to vectorize something, or you should not try to vectorize something. And it's basically like you know, driving without the seatbelt, you can say, I know what I'm doing, you know, go ahead and vectorize this, it's going to be okay. And it's up for you as the developer to use the programmer to make sure that like, there aren't going to be long-term problems. So two ways to do this is give it hints about what is the, you know, what can the compiler know about what's the, in the memory locations for pieces of data, or tell the compilers to ignore, ignore everything, you know, ignore, ignore its checks. So in C++, there's a strict keyword. Uh, I don't know if this is, is in the standard, but you basically can say, uh, I pass this restrict flag, or commit, I add this restrict edict here, then that just tells the compiler, don't worry about it. These guys are definitely going to be uh, different, different locations, and everything's OK. Um, yeah, so it's, I don't think it's in the C++ standard, but all the compilers will, will support this. right? I scan it. You're just, you're just giving a hint to say these things are definitely distinct. The other one is you pass these pragmas to say, uh, for this loop here, ignore everything, ignore any, any dependency checks, because it's going to be OK. Um, there's other pragmas, like in like OpenMP, you can say pound define pragma uh, simd, and it basically does this, the same thing. Right? So it's saying any checks you would have to make sure that, 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 would, that you, you're being cautious about making sure that these things don't clobber each other, you could ignore that and then try to, try to vectorize this. Right? And again, this is, you as a developer is doing this. You're telling the compiler, it's OK. Go ahead and vectorize this. So if you write crappy code and you pass in the same memory addresses, you're screwed. All right. All right, the last one is to do explicit vectorization. And this is where we actually write the commands or the, the, the I don't want to say functions, because it's not always functions, but it's the actual instructions or operations to do the vectorization explicitly in our code. Um, and this can be done through what are called intrinsics. These are basically compiler directives that are just aliases to the actual instructions that do perform the, perform whatever the low level operation that it is we want to do. So the problem with this one is that it's not going to be portable across all uh, CPUs, definitely not portable across ISAs. If I try to do, you know, take SIMD intrinsics and try to run it on ARM versus x86, it's not going to work. But as I showed before, even within the same version of, like, same ISA, so x86, if I'm running on a CPU that doesn't have the, the, the intrinsics I need for the AVX512, the compiler is going to throw an error. Right? So there are libraries that hide some of this complexity. Uh, Google Highway is probably the most famous one. I don't know, again, I don't know of any other database system that's using it, but it is a way to get you know, an abstraction layer, a programmatic API to using uh, SIMD instructions without having to make expl explicit uh, intrinsics calls because the, the manual pages for these things are, are atrocious. SIMD, unfortunate name. This is probably the, the, the other most uh, widely used one. Uh, Eve is a rewrite of another engine. And then because he's here, uh, this is what, if you want to use Rust, you would use this. But as far as I know, it's still experimental. 
Except so, I'm using all the way parameterization. You're using what, sorry? All the way parameterization. So I just write a for loop and the compiler. Right, right, it's, it's, okay, so you say. You're saying, uh, yeah, so using auto vexation and, and it works. Yeah. So I will say STD Cindy documentation is funny because I see my name everywhere and it's like. <laughs> Did, wait, you see your name in the documentation? <laughs> I mean, like. Did you write it? No, my nickname is Abby and like, it also oh. happens in binary interface. So I just like, there's so, like so many Abby types. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry, all right. <laughs> okay. So here's how to do, again, the same operation before, explicit in Cindy intrinsics. So this underscore, underscore, that's the syntax. That's the, 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 that's the, whatever, the preferred prefix of what they use for intrinsics. So this is just saying I want to do load up a, uh, my, my, my integer vector into, sorry, integer pointer, load up uh, into a 120-bit Cindy uh, integer register, same for y and z. And then now I'm changing my for loop to go over chunks of four. Right? And then I'm doing the addition of the two vectors and then writing out to memory to the other vector. Sorry, writing it to the other register. And then if I want to turn the result, I've got to get it out. Right? And so it actually stored in Z. But it's possible that the memory is not aligned. Yeah, so the statement is in this example here, am I assuming the memory is aligned? Yes. Yes. Keep, keep it simple. Um, we, did we discuss memory alignment, right? Or no? No? OK. Uh, yeah, it's, it's assuming that it's aligned. Um, if, we, if I need to cover memory alignment, we, we can cover that in another lecture. We used to cover one of the in-memory database stuff, but now we don't. Um, all right. So like as I said, the major database vendors are going to use intrinsics, at least the ones that are running in the cloud, because they control exactly what hardware they're running on. If it's on-prem, then things are a little bit dicier, and then maybe you want to use uh, Either rely on auto vectorization for simple things or use one of those wrapper libraries. All right, so now that we, now we understand how we're going to implement SIMD, uh, now we understand, again, what are the fundamental building blocks we're going to use in, in SIMD, explicitly in AVX 512, that are going to allow us to build up and do more sophisticated things like doing scans and uh, hash, or hash table lookups. So we'll first talk about masking. Again, this is the big thing in the paper that I talked about that AVX 512 added that allows us to. Uh, to identify or only perform certain operations on different lanes based on previous, you know, previous operations we've done. And again, you could do this before, it's just that there wasn't explicit, you could do this before in AVX2, but it, it, there wasn't explicit instructions or bit, map, bit mask ve vectors to do this, these kind of things. You just had to mainly do it yourself. Then we'll see permute, and, that's, and then select and load and store would be the same thing as permute, but within going in and out of memory. Compress and expand, and then select it, gather, and scatter will be the same thing of going in and out of uh, registers in the memory. OK. So what 5.12 adds, AVX 5.12 adds, is these uh, predication variants that allow you to pass in a, a for, for most operations, you can pass in now a bit mask, bit mask vector that tells you what lane should be operated on in, in, the, in, in the, whatever the operation that you're doing. Right, so there's the, there's the non-predicate predication versions, and then there is the, there are the ones where you can pass the, pass the bit, bit, map mask, bit, map bit mask in. There you go, sorry. All right, so to do add to, uh, say we want to do an add again. So what we're going to do is we have the, these, the, you know, the two vectors we want to add together, one and two here. And then we have a mask here that says for what lanes we want to actually apply the addition for. And then we're going to have this merge source vector that basically says for any, uh, any, uh, location or lane in the in the mask that has a zero, go copy whatever's in that lane in the uh, in the merge source. So these two ones or th these two uh, offsets in the mask are, are one. So I'm going to go ahead and do the the SIMD addition for those. Write it into my output vector, and then for the ones that are zero, I go get copy the values that are in the uh, you know in the merge source. So this looks like I'm doing this in like multiple steps. But in actuality, again, the instruction is essentially doing this atomically. Like within one instruction, it's taking, it's, it's going to produce this output vector that has this, all these results. So it's not like I have to write a for loop and manually do this, or have an if clause, say if, if it's one or zero, do this. It's one instruction, and it shoves everything into my output vector. Right? So this is the merge version of, of masking. 
Uh, there's also a zero version where instead of passing in uh, a separate merge source vector, it just assumes that it's zeros, right? So I, it'll, it'll put zeros in instead of actually copying a value from another vector. All right. All right so now we can use this. Uh, the next step is use, use permute. And the idea here is that for each lane in our, in our input vector, uh, we're going to map the, uh, we're going to determine the, for each lane in an input vector, we're going to look at this index offset vector, and that's going to tell us where the, uh, at that lane, what, what value to copy into it. Right? So you think of like this, this index vector, each of these, these, these lanes here correspond to a lane in, in the output vector. So now the idea is that the offsets specified in the index vector correspond to the offsets in the input vector. So I start with the first one here. So this says I want at lane, the first lane, I want the, whatever the value is in is offset 3. So I copy this thing here up into the, into the output vector. And then you get, you get D. And then you go down the, down the line for all the other ones. Right? And again, you could do this. It, you, you could do this fundamental step in, before ABX 512. The difference was like you had to put it out to memory, then do the shuffling, and then put it back into the register. And then now I can keep everything in, to, in the registers, and that's way, way, way faster. Right? Copying from register to register is faster than copying from the register to L1 and then back to the register, for obvious reasons. All right, so if I want to get things out of, in and out of memory, I have similar things. I have a selective load. So again, I have now my, uh, my mask here that's telling me what, what, at each lane uh, what value to put into it. So in this case here, 0, I leave it alone. One says get the first one uh, from the memory location, so you give it a starting address. That copies into it. This is zero, leave that alone. Next one, you get one. That copies the next one. All right? Selective store is the same thing. So I want to, this is putting out into memory. Um, so I have my register, and, and then the, the masses tell me where to copy things into memory going across. So now I can do compress. Yes? So in the different side, like how are these like, operations implemented in memory in terms of the, the mask and the fact that we're able to compress everything together in one go? Like, is it executed all together? How, how is it done? Like, how, how does it manage to like, compress everything into one? Uh, uh, how, how does it manage? If you have like, a normal mask, you could select nothing B, nothing D. That, that's OK. But like, how do you select it so that B and D are next? Uh, wait, so, so going out to memory, writing out to memory, how do I put, make sure that B and D go, go next to each other? Yeah, or? Are they done as sequential operations or are they done together? What do you mean by sequential? Like, like, do you first put B in memory, then you put D in memory? No, right? You put it all together. Yeah. Like this? This is all together. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm just saying, like, what, what's done on the inside to like, make sure B and D go together? It's hardware. Okay. It's magic. I don't know, right? <laughs> It's not my problem. Uh, no, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's Harvard's doing this, right? Um, at, at the lowest, lowest level, do I care what the wires are or like whatever the interconnects? No, uh, I, I care about I care about the cycles. Uh, and so I was also this selective store. I don't think you could. I don't. You may not be able to do this with actually Xeons now. Maybe uh, you couldn't do it before. I think the new ones can handle this. Uh, but th this one, this one you can do, right? Because it's just writing out, out, out to it. Okay. All right. So the next one is compress, and the idea here is that we we want to uh, store all the active elements that are that are specified by our index vector into uh, into a, contiguously in our target register, right? So say this is our input vector here, A, B, C, D. Then we have some index vector here, one zero zero one. So these these offsets, or sorry, these the values in here in the, each lane correspond to a lane in the input vector. The idea is we're just going to write into our, our, our output vector, our value vector, just contiguously, right? So in this case here, the first one is 1, so we're going to copy A into there. And then we have this 1 over here, for, and that's going to copy D into this location. And then that means that the rest is just left as zeros. And we're going to use this when we do selective scans because uh, Say that this mask here is going to correspond to which, which tuples evaluated in a predicate to true or false. So you want to get all the tuples that evaluated true, 
and put them contiguously in our, in our output vector, right? So we can throw away the others and then keep processing them in, in our pipeline. And the paper you guys read, they made a big deal about how to then go back and fill in, uh, if you have unutilized lanes, how to go then fill in additional values. Expand is then taking, uh, storing contiguous elements um, in the input vector at certain positions in the target vector. So again, our lanes map up like this. So we have the first one here, and that's going to correspond to say, I want whatever, uh, I want A to go in there. And this one here says, all right, the next one, give me, give me whatever. Then after A, give me the next one. That's, that's going to be B. So then B goes there. Then everything is, is left to zero. So if you want to get things in and out of memory, uh, you can use selective scatter and gather. So in this case here, uh, again, these index vectors are going to correspond to the lanes here, correspond to the lanes and the value vector going from memory into uh, the value vector. So this is just going to say at, at this first, first lane here, it has a 2. So I want whatever is in W to go up there, and then so forth for all the other ones like that. Scatter is going uh, in the reverse direction. So I have my value vector. And I have an index vector. So the, this, this position here tells you where to store whatever's in this, this yeah, store whatever's in the value vector at each lane. So I'll put an A up there. I, I, yeah, that should be A. I missed that, sorry. Um, and so forth like that. All right? So the, uh, in terms of performance, uh, like L1 can only do like one or two loads and stores per instruction. So I don't know how fast this is, like going in and out of memory. Like, like I'm showing this done like as if it's done atomically, but I don't know whether like you can do, it, it, you know, these things also go across cache lines. I don't know whether that's, that's all done in a single cycle or not. If it's, if it's not contiguous, but we can ignore that for now. All right, so now with these, uh, with these, these sort of vectorized fun vectorization fundamentals, we can then build algorithms now uh, in our database system that are going to rely on these things and try to, again, try to keep everything in, in registers for as long as possible. And the, so this is going to come from a different paper that I didn't have you guys read. Um, it's from a few years before, from 2015. So this was for a um, sort of real bare bones prototype execution engine. It didn't do, you know, didn't do SQL, didn't do indexes and, and compression and things like that. It was just a, a, a testing ground for vectorized versions of these different algorithms, right? And in their approach, the paper, the, the paper basically says, here's a bunch of different algorithms you could use to do the most common operations in a database system. And the paper you guys read from, from the hyper guys, that was like, they, they, they sort of cherry picked just two of them, the, the ones that are most common, the scans and the hash table ones. So in this paper, what they're going to do is they're going to try to, to uh, they're going to prefer vertical vectorization, where I'm taking two registers and doing some operation on them and producing an output, rather than the horizontal vectorization was taking one vector and then sort of doing one thing, combining it down to a single scalar value. Because right, that's going to allow them to get, get the better utilization uh, of, of the hardware and you know, process more tuples more quickly. All right, so we'll do, we'll do selective scans or selection scans, uh, hash tables, and then we'll finish up with partitioning and histograms. All right, so we, t we showed before, a, we spent time talking about uh, how you'd want to do a scan in, in a su you know, super scalar CPU where you want to avoid if clauses because if the, uh, the branch predictor mispredicts what you know, whether they're going to go down the if clause or not, you pay a big penalty because it has to flush the instruction pipeline, throw away a bunch of work, and then load the pipeline back up. And so we showed how in this version here, if I just remove the if clause and always do, always copy the, 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 always copy the tuple into our output buffer, and then use the, um, use, use the this, uh, ternary operations to decide whether the, the delta is going to be 1 or 0, and then I loop back around and then you know, overwrite something that maybe they didn't get evaluated true last time. Like this approach was faster um, in, you know, in, in some the most common cases when it wasn't that selective because we, we, weren't, we weren't paying a big penalty for the, the branch predictor. So in SIMD, we're going to have the similar challenge where we're not worried so much about the, the well, we're still worried about branch misprediction, but we don't, we can't have if clauses in our, 
uh, you know, or branching in, in our SIMD operations, right? There is no if SIMD instruction. So we're going to take what we did before on the scalar version of this and, and modify it to, to work in a, in a vectorized environment. All right? And it basically looks like this. So now, again, okay, instead, instead of looping every, every a table one, or tuple one by one each table, and now I'm going to get a vector of, of, uh, vector of tuples. Uh, and then I'm going to load them into my SIMD registers, then apply my uh, SIMD evaluation uh, to do comparisons. And again, this is going to produce a bit map, bit map, a bit mask vector that tells me what tuples in my vector are, are evaluating true or false. And then I, then I write it back out to memory. And then if, uh, if none of them were set to true, then I know I, do, I don't need to offset as much. Or I should not update the offset and come back around and overwrite them when I, when I come around again. So this, this is abstract. This is fake. So let's actually see how to do this with real values here. So let's change our, uh, our select statement now to actually be you know, where key is greater than or equal to 0, or sorry, or O, it's the character O, and key is less than or equal to U. So say I have a table like this, uh, with, with, I have a bunch of tuple IDs, 1 through 5 or 1 through 6, and then I have the keys, again, assume it's a single, single character, uh, and it says Joy sucks. That was my first PhD student. He, he, he does not, trust me. Um, so, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to store this, this, this column into a vector. Again, I'm showing characters, you know, just make it easier to understand, but like, assume that it was integers. And then I'm showing six characters or six values here. That's a weird number. Or assume it's you know, some power of two. Right? All right, so the first thing I do is do the SIMD compare, and that's this part here. Right? I, mean, I, I can do my evaluation in, since I have is key le greater than or equal to this and, and key less than or equal to that, that's going to be two SIMD operations, two SIMD comparisons. But then the output is going to be the bit mask that says, you know, the zero if it matches, uh, one if it does, does not. So now I want to get back and say, well, what tuples, what are the IDs of the tuples that actually match? So to do that, if I just have another vector that just has all the offsets, I could then use SIMD compress to now produce, a, uh, produce a, an output vector that just tells me what offsets in the actual column itself and in the table itself actually match my, uh, match, match my, um, my predicate. Right? And it's nicely aligned so I can, I can you know, do something with it. Right? As opposed to if I ended up with this uh, and I, was, and I had a, didn't have SIMD instructions, I, had to write a, I would have to write a for loop that basically says if bit is set to 1, then it's, it's this offset. But I can just do all of this in, in SIMD efficiently. Right? So let's see what performance looks like for these. Um, so again, this is coming from the paper from 2015. So it's an older, uh, it's an older CPU. I think it's a Hoswell, um, uh, Hoswell Xeon. And then they had this other thing called the, the Xeon Phi. Has anyone heard of Xeon Phi before? No. Well, yeah. I mean, you were, you were, yeah, you were Apple on compilers. Uh, Xeon Phi was this thing from Intel where it was like their version of a GPU. It was, uh, like, instead of having, like, the GPU cores being, like, really, really simple, and you had, like, hundreds of them, thousands of them, you would have these coprocessors that had basically, like, Atom cores or Pentium 4 cores, uh, but they had SIMD instructions on them. I think probably AVX2. Um, and so you got less than 100 of them, but you could push things to them, like, like a GPU, to do some computations. And so Intel killed it off, I think, in 2019. Uh, There's some elements that came out of it that went into... Uh, the, the modern versions of the Xeon, but this is sort of what, this, this was their response to like NVIDIA to build something like this. Um, so you had one that, that would sit down on the PCIe Express, uh, you know, again, like a GPU. This one would actually sit up on the motherboard and actually you could run the OS, boot the OS from this one. And then this one with this little funky thing here, this is the interconnect called Omnipath. This is like their version to do like RDMA things um, or like uh, InfiniBand. It was like an interconnect to read remote memory. Anyway, so the, 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 the main thing to point out, though, is that for this paper here, it's an older version of the Xeon Phi uh, that didn't have out-of-order execution uh, and it didn't have speculative execution. So it's sort of like really simple cores that can just do you know, sequential processing. And then whenever there was a misprediction, or sorry, whenever uh, there was a branch, the, uh, the penalty was not as big as, as the 
um, it wasn't as big as, as, as doing a speculative execution system or a CPU, but it, it was just overall just, just slower because it couldn't speculative execute. So they're going to have four versions of this selective scan, selection scan. Again, they'll have the scalar version with and without the branching that we showed before. Then we'll have a vectorized version with and without uh, or late materialization. And basically, this means with late materialization means that, like, you didn't have to actually go and copy the tuple and put it back together, right? It's not a real database system. It was just like you have, you're ripping through uh, columnar data in memory, um, but just it didn't stitch things back together uh, until the very end, or they just ignored that cost. All right, so the first number here is this, the, the scalar version uh, that's branching. Then you have the, the branchless version. And again, because there's, uh, there's no benefit in spec of execution in, in, the, in the PHY, uh, and the, the CPUs are slower in general, that copying cost of always copying every single tuple was just slower. But whereas in this case here for the, for the Xeon, uh, you, you do see a difference. I forget why this is not downward, down here in the branchless version. Um, but then everything, once you get to uh, selectivity of 100%, now you're, you're saturating me memory bandwidth. So just, there is no difference in performance because you're always just trying to read things uh, out of memory into the caches. But now for the vectorized versions, uh, in the case of the uh, Xeon Phi, you see a huge difference in the cost of, of late materialization without, without, with doing late materialization because, again, it's less overhead. And that's why the performance penalty for the early one is, is, lower, is higher. In the case of the Xeon Phi, there isn't a difference. I think the reason is just because uh, the main cost is like getting the data in and out of, of the registers, not, the, uh, not materialization stuff, because that comes later. And so the main thing here shows like with vectorization, you're getting a you know, pretty significant performance improvement over, over the scalar version. Even though, even though this is old hardware. Yes? Uh, for scalar, why is branching better in case of the first? Sorry, not this. Uh, for for which one? Yeah, like why, why is the red and the black opposite working? Uh, why, why is branching doing better in one case and not in scalar? Branching do better in this case here always because, um, because it didn't have, uh, it doesn't have uh, speculative execution. So like, and the cost of copying was so high. So like if you're always copying, then checking to see whether you should have copied or not, it's better to check whether you should copy and then don't do it. That, that's why that's the case. But I don't, rem I don't, I don't remember why this isn't now, uh, oh, sorry, this is the branch list, sorry. Yeah, it should be the case that the, 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 the branching version at selectivity of 0% should be faster than this, but I, I forget why. The main thing I want you to get out of this, again, the SIMD is faster until you saturate memory bandwidth. Wait, is there branchless vectorized, or is that considered? This question is, is there branchless vectorized? It, it has to be, it's always branchless. Oh. Yeah. Because again, you can't have an if clause. You can't have a conditional without going back to CPU instructions. You can't do it all in SIMD. So you, you, you use those bit masks to decide what, what moves forward in, in the evaluation. So the question is, why is it the case that uh, when selectivity is super low, that this is like so much faster? No, 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 no. like so high. On the oh, why, why is it, every, why is, sorry, why is everyone over here? Yeah. It's the memory bandwidth. Just like, so the, the cost of just copying everything out just crushes you. So again, the reason why I didn't have you guys read this paper and I had to go read the hyper paper is because the, this paper here, again, they make a bunch of assumptions that don't work in the real world, right? Like the, you know, your, your, your memory pointers aren't 32 bits and your, your keys are always gonna be 32 bits. And they did that because that made it aligned in the, in the registers that they had at the time. The guy who wrote this paper then went off and built all the, the SIMD stuff in, in, on Redshift. Uh, so Redshift is doing similar things, just there isn't a paper about it. Okay. So in the, the example that I showed here, the, uh, if for each batch of tuples or vector tuples as, as we're processing along, uh, that there's going to be entries in it that are for invalid tuples or for tuples that did not match whatever the predicate or checks were doing, 
but because they're still sitting in our CP registers, you know, we're still operating on them as we go along, right? And you know, at some point, there could be a check in, in, inside our, our pipeline that says, OK, if, if my, my bit mask is all zeros, then I know that it doesn't make sense to go keep processing. I should bail out my loop and go back and get the, get the next vector. But if at least one of them is still valid, then I have to keep processing. Or I can decide how to go then uh, go get more tuples and fill, fill in the vectors. So look at an example like this. So I have a, it's an aggregate query uh, where I have a check where age is greater than 20. I'm going to do aggregation on, on the city field. So the issue is that, if again, say this is our query plan here, uh, in a scalar version of this, you know, we, we want to be able to sort of vectorize this point here. But again, the problem is going to be, like, if I, if I can vectorize this aggregation lookup, then I don't want to, you know, if I only have some of the tuples matching in this, then uh, you know, when I do my aggregation, I'm not going to get the full benefit of SIMD because I'm going to be doing wasted work. Or I have to do a bunch of stuff to make sure to throw out the things that shouldn't be aggregating. Right? And then for you know, the pipeline, last pipeline, that, that's pretty big. Pretty, there's, nothing, there's, nothing, there's nothing magic there. So in the paper you guys read, they talked about this materialization model from the Menon et al. Right, that's, that's Prashant. That was my, one of my PhD students. He now works on Photon at, at, at Databricks. <laughs> building a, uh, you know, building a vectorized engine. Um, and so the paper that they were citing is this thing called relaxed operator fusion. And the basic idea was we, you, it's a way to introduce stages within a pipeline that allow you to make decisions about whether to proceed or go back and get more tuples. So again, the paper you guys read had a, all these additional checks about you know, when to go back at different locations. But our idea here was to have at places where you know the SIMD would stop, and there may be more SIMD to do after, or vectors instructions to do after that, you just introduce these artificial buffers that you can then fill up, go back, get more tuples, and then when the buffer gets full, then proceed with the next stage in the pipeline. So again, the pipeline is, is trying to take a bunch of operators that where you know you, you can proceed all the way up, or f far as you can up in, in the query plan before you have to go back and get more data uh, before you can proceed to the next pi pipeline. So the idea is introducing some of these, these, these mini pipeline breakers artificially into, uh, in, into the pipeline. All right? So let's see, going back to our example here. So we have, again, the simple aggregation function. So say that we know we want to vectorize this, right? But then what we want to do is we introduce this stage buffer here so that we can do this part in stage one as much as possible. And then until our stage buffer is full of tuples we know have satisfied our predicate, then we move on to the next stage. Right? So you know, really simple pseudocode would look like this. So the first stage, again, is this part here. We're just iterating over vectors of tuples in the table. And we're doing, doing our, our comparison. And then we have this, uh, this second stage for, for this, when the buffer is full, then actually do the aggregation. I'm not showing how to do this vectorize. I'm just showing a real simple pseudo Python. But the key point is this, this buffer part here, where if my buffer has gotten full up to some size, some threshold, then I then jump into, here, to, into this part and then flush the buffer by then applying the, the, doing the operations in the next stage. Again, I'm not showing also too, like if, you know, if, you, if you bump out of this, this, this for loop on the, on, the, on the scan of the table, you gotta go check where the buffer actually has anything in it, but assume that there's, some, there's a check there, right? And then for this last step here, it's just this, this aggregation uh, piece here. So, yes? How many registers there are there? Vectorized units. Uh, the new ones, the first version of AVX 512 had one. Uh, I think the new, the new ones have, have more than that. But it's, it's like less than 10. It's not like hundreds or thousands, right? Um, and again, this is, a, this is a really simple example here. Like, like, I, I can do this like, simple SIMD operation to compare, you know, is, is value less than 20. But think I have more complex, complex predicates operating in different columns at the same time. You, you have a stage of these, 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 uh, these series of these, these SIMD operations you're doing on it, and you're sort of moving things from one register to the, to the next. So one of the advantages of, that you can get of this approach, which I don't think the paper you guys read talked about, is that since you know you're, you're running this sort of tight loop here, 
uh, and then occasionally you may pop, pop down in here and do something. Um, assuming, again, this, that this step here is more complicated, you can actually give a hint to the CPU using what software prefetching and say, hey, by the way, I'm about to read this next piece of memory. Go fetch it for me if you can. It's, not, it's, not, it's a non-blocking call, so you're not going to block and wait until it shows up in, in your CPU cache. But the idea here is that you, you avoid last level cache misses because you know you're reading things uh, you know, contiguously. Or you know exactly what you're going to read next because you, you know, you're in charge of, of, of iterating over this loop. So you can use software prefetching to, to send, tell the CPU, hey, I want this new thing. Uh, I'm going to work on this other piece of data, but go get me this other data because I'm going to come back around and actually get this. And so the, we're not going to go into too much details of this, but like where you actually want to put your stage buffer, this, these artificial staging uh, areas, it's kind of based on where you think the, the amount of time you, processing you have to do versus the amount of time it's going to take for the CPU to prefetch the next piece of data you need. So that, that again, that, that you don't prematurely come back around and the data you, you, you need isn't there and you stall. Or you go too long processing the current data, and then by the, that time, the CPU evicts the thing you asked for because you didn't touch it, and then, then you have a cache miss. So figuring out exactly where to put this uh, is tricky, but it can make a huge, huge difference in performance because when I come back around, I, the data I need is already there, and you can reduce cache misses. So uh, there's different types of C, uh, CPU prefetching, software prefetching. We can ignore that for now, but just assume it's like, again, you, you, you give a hint to the CPU, I want this, go get it for me. And it tries to do it. It's no guarantee that it will. So this is a uh, result from the paper we published a few years ago. Again, this was the old Peloton system that became noise page, which we ended up killing because uh, we, could, you know, we just couldn't build a new system during the, during the pandemic anymore. To compete with the Germans was too hard. Um, but the... But this is showing you with, with LLVM's query compilation, which we'll cover next class, using the, uh, the hyper method with this sort of push-based approach with this pipeline fusion. You'll read about that next class. Um, but then with the, the uh, relaxed operator fusion. So for this particular query, the, the, the SIMD and vectorization and the, the prefetch doesn't help for this, uh, whereas in, for this particular query, it does. I forget the exact details of why this is the case for Q19 versus Q1. Like, but it's, the main takeaway from this is like it doesn't always work. Uh, it doesn't always make a huge difference. Uh, and, and there's a trade-off whether compilation versus uh, vectorization is actually the, the, the key thing you target. Vectorization is probably going to be the better approach. And it's, from an engineering perspective, it's, it's easier to do than query compilation, which we'll cover in the next class. Um, but if you combine them two, you, you, can, you, know, you can get a huge win. But not very few systems do that. Yes? Sorry, what is this is a TPCH benchmark, this, this standard benchmark. I forget the exact T. I think Q1, I think, doesn't have a join. It's just ripping through. I think Q19 has a join. You can double check. Or maybe, maybe it's the other way around. I forget. All right. So I'm going to show you this graph here. Uh, some of you know how much I hate t um, It's because of this graph, because he sold it. And f I gave a talk on this, and he f uh, And he did something unethical to Brashant. Um, it's still a good graph. F All right. All right, that sounds crazy. All right, but all right, so this is the, this is like the first version of Peloton we wrote was like this interpreted engine, and then we added a query compilation with the LLVM. Then we add the relaxed operator fusion with SIMD, uh, and then we add a relaxed operator fusion with SIMD plus the prefetching here. And you just see as you go down, you get progressively faster and faster. Like com compilation makes a huge difference. Uh, of course, obviously, of course, this, the old system was super super slow. Um, but with relaxed operator fusion and SIMD, you can carve up, you know shave it down by another sixty five percent. But prefetching at that point, the system is so optimized, you're getting a, a, a minor improvement. So the main way, the thing I'm trying to say is like, yes, you could do prefetching with this, but the engineering effort doesn't doesn't uh, you, don't, you don't produce a big win if you do that. Okay, I don't want to give the impression also too that that compilation is better than than using SIMD. Again, we'll, we'll see a paper in two classes that actually compares the two approaches in a single system. And it's a wash. Sometimes one is better than another. From an engineer perspective, SIMD, though, vectorization is better. It's less work. OK, so we've done selecting scans. Let's talk about new hash tables and partitioning histograms, just to finish up. Um, all right, so with, uh, with hash tables, the, there's nothing you can really do to speed up the build, build side. 
because it's, it's random lookups. And worst case scenario, you have to expand the, uh, you have to expand the, um, how do I say this? You have to expand the, uh, the hash table if you overflow. But I guess when, you, when you're probing to see whether you actually put it, you could speak, these techniques still work. But typically, you're going to use this on the probe side because that's the larger table, and you're trying to rip through that and do probes as fast as possible. So the scalar version will look like this. Again, I have my input key. I hash it. It gives me some offset mod by the number of, of, uh, of slots I have in my hash table, assuming we're doing linear probing. And then I land in some location in memory, and then now I'm just doing a comparison. Does, does this key equal the key that's in there? And I just keep scanning down until I find a match, and then I'm done. Right? So one way to vectorize this is to do what's is a horizontal approach, where we want to uh, use a single input key, but then compare it against multiple keys in the hash table at the same time, again, using vectorized instructions. So what we're going to do is that we're going to expand the, the, for each position or slot in my hash table, I'm going to sp you know, now store four keys per slot instead of one. And then likewise, I'll have four values in the, in the payload portion. So now when my input key shows up, I hash it just like before, and I land into some offset. But now instead of getting back a single key, I get back a vector of keys. Then I do my, my SIMD comparison to produce, uh, produce my output mask, a bit mask, of whether I match or not. If I have a 1, then I know I'm done because I found something that matches my key. But if it's, if it's a 0, then if they're all zeros, which I can do in SIMD quickly, I go down and see, keep, you know, go to the next one, fetch the next, the next four keys, and do my comparison. Right? So uh, this doesn't work uh, just because the, doesn't, it doesn't work if the key is too large. I guess all these purchases have this problem. Um, but the, the cost of, uh, you know, the cost of getting things out of the hash table and putting into this just becomes sort of too expensive. So what we want to do instead is vertical uh, vectorization, where now we're going to have multiple input keys we want to hash against. Again, think I'm scanning along on the probe side of my join. I'm getting you know, a, a batch of tuples, and I want to do a probe in the hash table and see whether there's going to you know, find, you know, find, find the keys I'm looking for each of them. So for each of these input vectors, uh, I'm going to hash them uh, individually and produce my ha hash index vector. Also, I have to point out here, going back here, uh, there, is, there are vectorized versions of this. Like, there are vectorized libra there's libraries that provide vectorized hash functions. right? But as far as I know, there isn't a, there isn't a SIMD uh, function that can take you know, four keys as input and, and hash them all at the same time, produce the output. You can use the Radex stuff we'll see in a second. It's a, like a, a poor man's version of a hash function. but if we're using, you know, we, we want to have low collisions, and we don't want to do that. All right, so we, oh, sorry. So we have our, uh, we have our, again, our hash index vector that's produced for the four input keys, and then now we have to do four probes into the hash table to go get uh, our meshing slots. Sorry, I cannot do this. All right, there we go. Good. All right, all right. So again, we do our probes. We land a bunch of different keys. Uh, we copy them in. We do SIMD gather on those. Bring them into our uh, into a, a single vector. Do our SIMD comparison across across the lanes, and then it's going to produce a, an output vector with ones and zeros depending on we have a match. All right. So now the, we have two ones here, so we know that we don't need to search anymore because we, we land exactly in our hash table that had the keys that we were looking for. But for key two and key three, since they weren't a match, we got to go to the next slot in the in, in their in their hash tables at their respective positions. And keep going until we find a match, or we get an empty slot, and therefore we know that we've, you know, there, there, there isn't, never, there never is going to be a match. So this goes back to that lane utilization that I talked about before. Like we could just keep scanning down uh, with this input vector here, and just ignore anything that happens for the first one and the last one because we we already know we found a match. But that's a waste of work, right? We may have to look at you know the entire hash table, and we're just we're, we're just burning cycles comparing things that we don't need to compare. So instead, what we want to do is go back to our, you know, in, 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 as we're scanning the, in, in the table, go back and get two new keys for the first and last position, uh, run our hash function again. For the, for the second and the third, third one, we just add one to where we were before because we want to step down through the hash table because we're doing linear probing. But the, the last, first and last one, we get new hash positions. And then we go back to the hash table, 
get new positions, do the same thing we did before, go fill our, fill our vector, and do the comparison again. Right? And again, the idea here is that every single time we're doing that Cindy comparison back here, the lanes are always full, fully utilized. All right? So there's one problem with this approach. Uh, you know, in addition to, to the, you know, the, the SIMD gather, uh, that's, that if these are parts, uh, the, yeah. the hash table is CPU cache, this is, this is going to be super slow, right? Because uh, you're, you're doing random probes into different locations in memory and hash table. So that's going to suck. Um, and I think the paper, the German paper talks about this, of like, oh, you can do radix partitioning to, to split it up to smaller cache size hash tables. We'll see that in two weeks, how to do that. Um, but there's another problem, and that is that the, because we're using the lanes dynamically, uh, it means the input keys are going to be read, read out of order. Now, under the relational model, that's OK, because there's no guaranteed ordering for, for any, any data. But from, from a developer perspective, this makes it kind of random that every single time you run your hash function on the same input data, you're going to get different results because things are going to happen in, in different order. Right? And this makes it much more difficult to actually to debug and figure out what's, when you have problems. So this is sort of implicit engineering complexity to this approach if you want to do something like this. But again, to get the advantage of Cindy, it's, it's unavoidable. The, the, stuff, the selection scan doesn't have this problem because it's just, you're just ripping through tuples and you'll, you'll fill things in uh, programmatically. All right. So quickly look at performance. Again, this is from the, the Columbia paper uh, with the, the Xeon Phi and then the older, older Hoswell. So again, when you, have, when you have a hash table size that's which is really small, the, you know, the, oh, sorry, go back like this. Yeah, when you have the, the hash table size is really small. The, the vectorized stuff does, does amazingly well. But when, you, uh, when, you, when you're at a CPU cache uh, for the respective uh, hardware sizes, then they've all converged to, to the same thing. Again, the German paper talks about this, that like, you don't get any better from SIMD when you're outside of L3. Right. All right, the last one I'll show you is how to do partitioning with histograms. Uh, not that this is a super, super common operation that, that you would spend a lot of time in a database system. I just think this is kind of neat, kind of clever. Uh, that's, that's why I like sharing it. So for this one, we're going to use scatter and gathers to increment counts. Um, and the way we're going to avoid collisions when we do our summations is that we're going to split the, the histogram across different, different lanes, uh, different registers, and then we combine all those registers together to produce this, with the horizontal uh, vectorization to produce our final output. All right, so say this is our input key vector. I'm going to compute a histogram of like what the occurrence of all the different keys are. And again, a histogram is an approximation of the actual values. So we're going to hash them and then basically fill, you know, add one to the location of the hash table if that key exists. All right, so since we don't have a hash function that uh, we, 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 that can operate on four keys or, or multiple uh, register at the, at the same time, we'll use a radix instruction, which is just taking like the first byte of, of whatever the value is. Again, it's a, it's a poor man's hash. So then we produce our hash index vector, and then this is going to tell us where in our histogram we want to write into. Right? And again, this, this is sort of a bad example. Like I have four keys and five elements in my histogram, but assume I have you know, a billion keys, and I'm trying to summarize this into a, a smaller vector size. So in this case here, this is not going to work for us because both uh, h2 and h4, those hash values here, are going to map to the same histogram location. So when I, when I, I do plus one on them, or I'm trying to increment the, the histogram to do this, they're going to, they're going to collaborate each other. And it's going to only have a value of one instead of two. Right? So I'm going, to, I'm going to be missing an action update here because I can't, it's not a for loop inside again on the hardware to like, OK, let me update this lane first and then, and then update it again. So plus one, plus one, twice. So all we need to do is just replicate our histogram, split across multiple, uh, uh, multiple copies of this. And then each, each of these are going to correspond to a, a lane in our register. So now when I, when I write the first element, I go to the first lane, write to the next element, I go to the next one, and so forth. Right? And then now to put, to put it together, now I just do a SIMD add going across the lane. And then I end up with the, the final result, the correct result. All right? It's always a loop for the time. So it's 309. 
That says 409, and this one says 312. I'm, I'm looking at three different times. OK. So this all sounds amazing, right? Uh, but the problem is, in, uh, with AVX 512, is that it's not always going to be faster than AVX2. And actually, can, in some cases, it'll actually make your process, make your data system run slower than if you didn't use any SIMD at all. So I don't know if anybody caught this in the paper here. This is uh, on one of the pages. There's a little history, or sorry, the foot, footnote down here that says, uh, please note that throughout our experiments, we did not observe any performance penalties through downclocking. Both the processors, the Knight's Landing is the Xeon Phi, and the Skylake is the, the Xeon. They both remain stable at their expected clock speeds. Anybody know what, you know, what they're talking about here? Well, it turns out that with, with uh, AVX 512, that Intel will actually downgrade the clock speed of the, of the, of the CPU when you actually execute some AVX 512 instructions. And you go to these AVX 512 modes. And there's actually two, there's sort of two levels of, of, of clock speed downgrading. There's one that's like a soft one that like it kind of does eventually. Um, but then there's a hard one, depending on what instructions you execute. Like I think with floating points, AVX 512, it'll do a hard reduction in, in your clock speed. And in some cases, it'll keep it for the remainder of the process. Right? So the, because of this, like I'll post on Piazza afterwards, there are some discussions on like the mailing groups for compilers that talk about, like for GCC, they say, you know, you almost never want to use 512. And by default, they'll give you 256 or AVX2 instructions if it tries to vectorize something. And only if you explicitly say, I definitely want to use AVX 512, then it actually tries to, tries to do this. Because some people will see a performance degradation uh, in their system because some, some piece of the, of the code or some library they're linking in is using AVX 512, right? Just go, why is AVX 512 slow? And you see a bunch of these like Stack Overflow pro, uh, posts where like somebody linked in some library that makes up AVX 512 call and they can't find out where that instruction is. And it's like one instruction that calls the, the, the process to run 50, you know, 15 to 20% slower, right? So there's this great uh, Stack Overflow post here. Again, this link's available in, in the slides. This guy explains exactly what's going on. Right? And he talks about these light instructions and heavy instructions, whether it's going to do a soft or hard uh, transition to the slower clock speed or not. Right? So I, as far as I know, this wasn't a problem for AVX2. It's only AVX 512. And I think Intel is doing this for heat reasons, because that these instructions somehow use more power. They generate more heat. Uh, and uh, you know, they don't want to burn out the CPU. So they'll, 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 they'll turn down the clock speed. So be mindful that even though the paper talks about the great things you can do AVX 512, if you're not careful about when you use it, then you know you, you can get better, you can get worse performance. There are ways to override this. Uh, we can say like again, take the seatbelt off and force it to always run with the higher clock speed. Uh, but again, like uh, depending on whether or not you control the hardware or not, will determine whether, whether you can do that. Okay. All right. So uh, the main takeaway from this talk or, the, or this, today's lecture is. That vectorization is this neat building block that we can use in our database system for, to speed up OLAP queries if we're careful about it. And if we can use this in combination of the additional parallelism stuff we talked about before, you're running multiple threads. They, you now, if we can, everybody's using SIMD to do sort of the most expensive parts of scanning a table, then we get, could get a huge, huge speed up in performance. But in, in practice, it's usually 2 to 4x. It's not the, the 100x that I showed in the beginning. right? So next class, we'll talk about query compilation. Now, which is sort of confusing because, again, this is sort of this idea of, like, oh, yeah, we'll compile queries. Like, this idea has, has, has been sprinkled in throughout the entire semester so far. But now we'll actually read the paper of how the, the hyper guys actually did it. And the paper having you guys read isn't the first one that, that did query compilation. But that's this sort of seminal paper in the last 10 years that says, oh, yeah, you should be compiling the, your database system uh, or compiling queries on the fly. They're going to use LLVM LL, LL, for it. Uh, the newer version, Umbra, actually emits direct assembly, which is insane, um, which is amazing. Uh, so anyway, so we'll, we'll cover all those techniques in the next class. And then we'll also spend time talking about project, potential Project 3 topics, because in two weeks, you guys have to then present your, your, your idea um, to class. And again, some of, the, some, of the, some of the people in the class have already talked to you what your topic could be. For others, if you're not sure, again, let's, let's show, I'll show what, I, what you can do on Monday. And then we can follow up next week and talk about things. Okay?
All right, guys. Enjoy the good weather. See ya. <laughs> That's my favorite all pattern. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Yes. It's the SD Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I can do it like a Geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, Duke. I play the game where there's no rules. The homies on the cup say I'm a fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a boy. Six pack 40 act gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>